Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is October 25th, 2024. And uh, Samuel, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick? Hi, my name is Samuel Cordereal from the Bronx. Great. Thank you, Samuel. Um, looking forward to your oral history today. And why don't you start off by just talking a little bit about your family history and background, whatever you know about it, and how your family ended up in the Bronx. Well, um, my family um, originally is from Dominican Republic. Uh, my father and my mom and my older brother and my sister. And my father came to this country in 1978. Um, he landed with my sister in the Bronx, my older sister, from his first marriage. And then in 1982, he brought my mother, my sister, and my brother to the Bronx. Um, um, Townsend Avenue, they lived there, on 170. And they still live there. And then I was born in 1983. Oh, wow. And do you know... Um much about like you know what your parents life was like in the Dominican Republic where they lived where they grew up that kind of stuff yeah uh, my mother grew up I believe in um, Santiago I believe uh -huh. and my dad um, our dad I think my dad as well or I think in in, a, in like a rural area like in the suburbs of Dominican Republic and whatnot okay I see I see um, and have, have they ever like shared much with you like uh did they have like family in the bronx like what led them to come to the bronx um like choose the bronx out of um other boroughs in new york anything in particular my father was brought to this country by my sister um uh, so my sister lived in the bronx and um my sister's mother um as well and uh, he just stuck with the bronx and they were kind of like the first of my mother's siblings to come down here so they they're stuck with the Bronx uh -huh, I see I see and uh, um, what are some of your own like earliest memories on like Townsend Avenue well my father um, I remember my father was like um, big into like vinyls and stuff like that so he had some vinyls he had like uh, Prince uh, Michael Jackson um, you know, my brother was into like break dancing and stuff like that. My sister as well, you know. So they they had records and they used to spin them and you know and because we lived in Townsend Avenue and on the fourth floor, and then you know later on we moved to the sixth. We they still lived there, and um, so that was kind of the thing. My mom was kind of into like Spanish music and my dad was into like spanish music as well but you know and my sister was very into modern music and um freestyle and all that stuff oh, freestyle for sure yeah mcdonald michael jackson yeah prince yeah. yeah um and like what kinds of things do you remember doing for fun like around the neighborhood would you play outside when you were a kid yes uh we would play baseball spongebob across the street which was ps64 was literally across the street from my house where my mom could see uh, uh me and my brother playing we would do um running man we would play um we would play uh 21 with the kids you know uh hide and go seek you know we were like very you know the, the block was very united you know I see, I see, and and like, what other kinds of families like lived on the block? Were there a lot of Dominican families on the block? Um, were there other? And my building was very diverse. We had, yeah. my building was very, uh, if back in the day was kind of like the building to like live in. It was, we had Jewish people, we had guy, we had a lot of Guyanese people. Oh, okay, yeah. We sure. had people from Taiwan. Wow. We had. Um, Jewish people, Dominican people, Puerto Rican people. We had a very diverse building, and that's what kind of made the, my building very unique. Our super was like Albanian, you know. We had um, we had a very safe building at, in the eighties, nineties. Sure. Wow. Um, and were there other parts of the Bronx when you were a kid that you would um, go to, like you know, before you became a teenager, like when you were a kid? Would you? Did you have family like in other parts of the Bronx? Or would you oh yeah, my sister Bronx? lived in Yankee Stadium and okay. 161st, so we used to go to her house a lot back in the day. Like, uh, 
She lived right next to Yankee Stadium. We used to go to Malali's Park. Um, my mother used to take us to Claremont Park when we were younger. Um, we used to go to Webster a lot, Fordham Road, you know, that was the thing with my mom, you know, going to Fordham Road and buying and shopping and, you know, car doors and uh -huh. Woolworth. We had a Woolworth on Towns and 170. Yeah, okay, okay. So well, that was that was a big deal. That is a big deal, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. We had it in Jerome, like, it was big. It was Woolworth, like, on 170, and then the Woolworth exit and Jerome by the 4 train. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So we had the four, we had the D, we had the eleven bus, we had the two, we had the one, we had the eighteen bus. Like we were in a, my parents, rented in a really good spot. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned the elementary school was right across the street from you. Is that where you went to elementary school? Unfortunately, no. My brother and my sister went there, but I went to PS uh, one ten first, which was on Claremont. Um, Claremont Avenue around that area around Third Avenue. Yeah, Washington. Then from there I went to like PCS two, which is down the block, okay. which is on Fulton Street next to where the Bronx Care, not Bronx Lebanon anymore, Bronx Care. Yeah, is like I went there for uh, I went there from sixth grade. Okay, I see, I see. Up to sixth grade, yeah. And what what were those schools like for you? Do you what do you remember about? They were great. Um, um, there were great schools. Um, my mom liked them a lot. My mom and my uh, father. Um, I learned a lot. You know, I um, you know I went to those schools because I had a, a learning disability at such a young age, and those schools really helped me in in in, in my adolescence to mature and and. Um, you know, to 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 get to junior high school and to and to eventually get out of special ed. Sure, sure. Um, did you like make friends at those schools, or were your friends mostly from the neighborhood? Where, where yeah, I had friends. From? I had friends from the schools that that we followed each other from there to junior high school to um, high school. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. A few. Wow. Um, now we're we're gonna get a lot more into music in a little bit, but. Uh, were were any of those friends into? Uh, did any of those friends become like into the same kind of music that you were into? The the ones that you had from childhood? No, okay. not not from the schools. Uh, yeah, yeah, from yeah. from the building, yes. Okay, I see. Okay, so we'll talk more about that in a second. Just getting a little background first. Um, so keeping with your childhood, you mentioned um, uh, you know music that your parents liked, music that your siblings listened to. Um, what kinds of music do you remember hearing, like on the street, for instance? Oh, it was a lot of Onyx, Patra. Uh huh. Um, we used to get uh, Patra, Onyx. Um, let me see. Um, my mother's Spanish music, um, Ana Grabie. You know, okay, yeah, stuff. sure, sure, sure. You know, I used to listen to that a lot, and my mom used to like burn that stereo, like with. <laughs> <laughs> and my sister was no my sister was a little diverse my sister Jocelyn she was a little bit more diverse she liked hip hop okay and she would be you know ordering from BMG and you know ordering tapes and then when tapes became CDs and stuff like that but she would she she used to watch a lot of um what was that channel on uh channel 13 radio music box or something like that yep yep so, I think that's the name of the video music Bugs. I know what you're talking about. So my sister, my sister was very hip, you uh -huh. know, and my brother as well. But my sister was always the one, you know, you know, getting us into the music and stuff like that, the hip hop stuff. Wow, wow. Um, do you remember? Did you go to like block parties or you know parties in the park or anything like that when you were a kid? Did we have? A, I think we had a block party, but um, we kind of stayed away from that. Because yeah. you know it could get uh, dangerous, but I, I, we, I, if if it was parties, it was with with them, like with my brother and sister. Yeah, sure. And it was in the building. Okay, yeah, 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 in the building. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, what do you remember? Like, what kinds of food do you remember most eating? Like when you were growing up as a kid. Ah, uh, we ate the turkey. We ate the penne. Uh -huh. we, you know, we ate the mango because we're Dominican. Of course, you know? of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. and um flan and my dad used to do papaya milkshakes that was a oh, big thing man. in the house you know um 
the Dominican cheese when he used to travel. Uh huh. You know, uh -huh. and then um, you know the Dominican, you know, um, candies and stuff like that, and like coconuts and stuff like that. We we th those were our things. Still is kind of still yeah. is my thing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and what what about like stores in the neighborhood? What kind of stores did your family shop at? Oh, they shopped at Woolworth. Well, we Jeans Plus, where they had you know my mom always went to Jeans Plus. There was like a, a lot of Arabics that used to sell like um, name brand clothes. My mom was very like we didn't ha we we didn't grow up with a lot of money, but my mom made sure that we didn't like wore some skips or, or like she was one of those moms like oh, my my son's got to wear nikes my daughter has to wear nikes or uh -huh, reeboks uh -huh. at the time etonics was a thing you know <laughs> <laughs> and triple fat goose my mom uh -huh. my mom did her thing wow wow yeah wow what and what about like food like gro you know grocery shops which was was there one in the neighborhood that we had sea town okay sea town yeah, yeah pioneer yeah. My mom used to go, you know, mostly to the one in Jerome, like, Sea Town there. But sometimes she would go to um, Pioneer or um, Associated. Yeah. You know where there was a Rite Aid now. Uh, now there's like a um, now there's like a uh, Urgent Care, but there there used to be a supermarket as well. I don't know if you would remember this because you're a kid, but you know, obviously now in a lot of grocery stores in the Bronx you go into, you can find like a pretty decent selection of like Dominican products. But did the grocery stores like that you remember when you were a kid, like could you find like Dominican brands in grocery stores or no? It's not. It's now now it's more he now I see it more the Dominican yeah. brands. Yeah. Now I see it more than when I when I was a child. Like no, when we were a little kid, no, we had to you had to go to the Dominican Republic, or uh -huh. you had to have an uncle or aunt or somebody who's going there to bring you what you wanted, like cheese, where there was um, uh, the pig blood, you know, the uh -huh. mosia stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I th I thought that's probably the case. Um, but um, but yeah, and then. You know, before we really start getting more into music, um, uh, just for a little more background, what high school did you end up going to? I went to DeWitt Clinton High School. Okay, okay, I see. So you said you went from CS2 to DeWitt Clinton, or CS? I went from CS110 to CS2. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Then that. to um, Junior High School 117. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's right. Okay, and, and where is Junior High School 117? It's near yeah. 170. Fifth Street on Morris Avenue, uh -huh. like by the D train. That's right. If you you know you could take the D or you could take the four to one seventy six and walk up the hill. And and what was that school like for you? Oh, that school was that school was great, but the only thing I didn't like is that we didn't go outside. Oh damn! But you know, at the end, towards towards my because I only went to seventh and eighth when 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 I was finishing eighth. They started and allowed us to go outside for recess, and that was like towards graduation. Oh, I see. They were trying to do an experiment, you know, with okay, now you know, because the school was dangerous. I see. Yeah. I see. I don't know how is it now, but yeah, we we were allowed to go outside, but just stay in the schoolyard, which was great. Do you like? Do you remember um, like any specific instances of? you know danger or it was just like you know oh just yeah the vibe. It, yeah it was just dangerous um like freshman friday you know that that really exists halloween uh -huh, uh -huh. then you got the drug dealers on the corner you had to watch our back you know you know taking the train you know we were young little kids and you know those guys were like um teenage we were like junior high schoolers and those guys were high schoolers or yeah Dropouts. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had to be careful with those those kind of people. They used to go there and kick it to the junior high school kids, and you know, and they went men in the twenties and stuff like that. Wow. Um, were there like uh, crews or or things like that in your neighborhood or you know around? Oh yeah, the there were. There were. There were. Uh, in, in in our block, um, one seven zero. There were the Bloods. Like in the ninety seven eights and stuff like oh, that. Oh, okay, yeah, a little. Yeah, a little, but yeah. and then um we had the Dominican gang there, you know, um called Dominican Don't Play, but you don't really see that much. We see bloods and now I'm there, but they you know, they don't really Townsend is still a, a a good you know, it's not as the worst area to live in, like, oh you could you know, 
it's still a good area. Yeah. It got, it, every area has its thing, but it you does. know. Yeah, yeah. For the most part, everybody kind of looks out for each other there. That's good. That's good. Um, and uh, are there like other things you want to share about your childhood? You know, anything else about like things you do for fun or anything like that before we get more into music? Yeah, when I was when I was growing up, my uh, my uncle, well, my cousin, and my father, we all connected through baseball. So we used to see, go watch the Yankee games in Malali Park get the bleacher tickets because that's all we could afford. My sister was big into like sports too, so she used to come along. Um, we used to go to Playland. Um, that was our thing. Um, we played video games, you know, Nintendo. Like my mom always made sure that we kind of had it, you know, like we yeah. had we had those kind of, you know, things. Um, the neighbors, you know, we kind of like family. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, and um, what'd your mom and dad like do for work? My mom was a home caretaker. My dad worked at a um, he worked at a, a factory. He used to assemble um, jacks for like cars, like like hydraulics. So he worked there for like twenty plus year, like maybe thirty years, and then wow. he retired. And then he went to work at Van Cort and Park. And um, he worked there as a, uh, he used to drive the golf carts and man it, uh -huh. give it to the customers and maintain, maintain the carts and stuff like that. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, yeah. Yeah, keeping it in the Bronx for sure. <laughs> yeah, after working in New Jersey for 30 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, coming back to the Bronx. Yeah. Working in a Bronx park, wow. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, do you want to talk just in general about like your experience at DeWitt Clinton? I, I imagine if you're like other people, you probably were already starting to get into like heavier music then, so it's probably like tied up with that some. But just before we get more specifically into music, just like your general time at DeWitt Clinton, what was, it was going on? It was great because my older brother uh, from my father's side went there, and my brother from my mom's side, my mom and dad's side, w went there. And they talked great about D. with Clinton and how great a school it was, and it was a good school. My experience there was great. You know, I met a lot of people. Um, I I was able to graduate Clinton in three years. Obviously, wow. um, I made a lot of good friends, a lot of good teachers. Um, it kind of like shaped me because it was you know a school that really really was um, into education. You know, they really cared about the students there um, with giving us a lot of freedom. You know, we were one of the few schools that were allowed to go out for lunch. Uh, you know, I mean, that's not the story now because of, of uh, the charter schools. They ruined it. Uh -huh, but uh -huh. Clinton was like, oh, if you got into Clinton, it was a big deal. Like, it was either you get into Clinton, you got into Lehman High School, or you got into science. Uh -huh. And if you got into Clinton, it was like top two public school, like... We don't even count Bronx Science because Bronx Science was like a special school and yeah. you had to take an exam. Yeah. But we co I commingled with Bronx Science kids there. You know, I was really good friends with students there. They used to come down, obviously, for the, you know, the music. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, so, so yeah, let's let's start getting a little more into music. Um, uh, what's the first time that you, like, remember hearing kind of heavier music whether you know it was hard rock or you know maybe it was met whatever it might have been what's the first time you remember hearing it my neighbor downstairs uh my best friend at the time ariel okay he used to like green day uh-huh uh -huh. so he was he had he was listening to when i come around that song yeah and he had kerplunk that cd so at the beginning you know i was all hip-hop out i was all rap you know, Onyx, Patra, Tupac, uh, you know, course. and I'm like, what the F are you listening to this whack crap, you know, and <laughs> so he kept listening to it, listening to it, listening to it, and then like Saturday Night Live had Green Day, and he's like, yo, you got to come to my house and watch it, and I'm like, this is corny, and then <laughs> I find myself listening to it, <laughs> and then I'm like, I went and got it. You know, and I went and bought, I went and bought the tape, and then um, 
with my own money. No, I don't know. No, I borrowed his. I didn't buy anything. Uh, to a while later, but then it was that band, and then it was Alice in Chains. Uh huh. I, you know, and I used to make fun of him with that too. So then he kept listening to it, listening to it. You know the um, the album with the three legged dog. Uh, keep forgetting the name. I know what you're talking about. Not dirt. I think it's yeah. Um, that album, and um, I borrowed it. Yeah. And I kept listening to it myself, and then I, that's when I kind of like okay. Then Silverchair, and then you know Silverchair was like the first. That album Frog Stomp was the first thing I bought with my own money oh, from a pawn shop and one seven zero. Wow. Yeah, and my mom gave me. Uh, I think she gave me twenty uh, twenty dollars for Christmas. And I went and I bought the tape. It was like ten dollars, and then uh, I was so hype. I was like, "Wow, my first tape!" You know, because I was so used to buying the bootlegs. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah, have yeah. money like that, so I used to buy like the hip hop things for five dollars, and then ten dollars was like, "Wow, that's a lot of money." I know. I, I got a hip hop bootleg for three dollars. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but I was listening to that, and um, then after that, you know, listening to those couple of bands i had a neighbor in my building who's named clifford he's guyanese and um he was very alternative and um he was into like green day he was into deftone silverchair live you know um smashing pumpkins and you know i was already into those things because obviously 92.3 k rock uh -huh. was a thing so we started listening to those bands deftones and corn and um then I started like listening to Marilyn Manson for a little while. I had that little Marilyn Manson phase in sixth, uh, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth okay. grade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was obsessed with like Marilyn Manson. My parents didn't get it. You know, my sister was like, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> <laughs> did you did you dress the part? At I that did. Time? I did in ninth okay. grade. In ninth grade, when I went to Clinton, I had I had my friend who was alternative, Clifford, and uh, his cousin who lived downstairs. He still lives downstairs of my mom's building, Andre, who was into Mount Talca. They used to wear the ball chains and stuff like that. I went to Clinton and I was like, I want some air walks and I want the Y legs. <laughs> yes. And my mom was I bought I couldn't afford the Jinkos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That so was I went to I went to um um Conway's and I bought these cheap ones and, and I wore them for like uh, like the whole summer of, I went to before going to high school well before going to ninth grade I went to Clinton for like summer school oh sure sure to get like an introduction of what his high school is you know and uh, I met some girls there and they're like man what the hell are you wearing those and, and they were metalheads too yeah yeah but they, you know some of them uh, some of us used to wear those wild eggs and That's stuff right. like that so then, like, the whole ninth grade was bad because they used to tease me with the, mm. the pants. They're like, oh, you dress like it, you dress like it. And I'm like, what that means, you know? Like, oh, you listen to metal, but you don't have to dress like it, you know? Like, so then I was like, you know what? You're right. I ended up throwing those things away because they were, like, goofy, and I just wore, like, regular pants. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I just sure. wore a band shirt. So, like, that was the only way you would know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, obviously, my book bag was full of patches. Of but, course, of course. But, um, and the ball chain and the long chain and, you know, but uh, that was the only way you knew that I listened to metal. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the Jinko. Yeah, the they're jeans. coming back. Oh, my God. I yeah, know. This, I heard they, that. Yeah, there's kids who now in current current era of hardcore. I go to shows and these, kids, these goofy kids are wearing them. I, don't, <laughs> I know. But I don't understand. But me, um... When I was in um, Clinton, um, meeting a metalhead was like, was so great. It was like, wow, it's like you buying a CD because now you have a connection with somebody who listens to the same thing. So when I got there in summer school, I had no friends. And I had met one kid that, he was African-American, he's black, and his name is Rev. And he's, he lives in the Bronx. Obviously, we're all from the Bronx. Yeah. Um, and he was wearing a Marilyn Manson shirt. And I was like, wow, he's the coolest guy. Like, and then um, he, he, he saw me, and I was wearing my, you know, Marilyn Manson t-shirt. I had two. That I, I burned those shirts to the ground. I used to wear them so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had the This Is Your World, which we would grow, and we would grow to hate you shirt. And he had the one with the halo. Uh-huh. And, like, 
And then um, I was like, yeah, I listen to metal. And then he's like, yeah, I listen to metal. And then he's like, kind of introduced me to everybody. Like, um, there's these twins that they, they're from this area. Okay. They're called um, Marie and uh, Jessica and Maria. Marie. Okay. They're, they're, I don't, they don't live here no more. But they were like, they were from exactly this area. We kind of hung out around this area. Um, those twins were in Clinton. And uh, they were goth. But, you know, they listen to music stuff. We had those girls. We had the Dominican, um, another guy that looked kind of like me, Nick Kelvin. We had a little little clique there of metalheads and stuff like that. And um, obviously the Bronx Science kids used to come down uh-huh. and stuff like that. But um, we didn't really have, uh, well, yeah, we had two people in our, in our clique that played instruments and stuff like that. But um, not really well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of them did. Uh, his name is Amari. He played guitar. Rev, the kid that I made the connection with, he played drums. But, um, you know, from there in Clinton, I joined uh, the marching band. Uh-huh. I used to play the um, crass cymbals. And I joined uh, the actual jazz band. I used to play the upright bass. Oh, wow. In, in the school. And I, and I played it for like three years. And uh, my Clinton High School was the first school in the Bronx that had a marching band. Wow! So that they eliminated my uh, my gym. Um, That's great. <laughs> to to put that class as a uh, marching band, and which was great too because it counted as a credit, so it boosted up my uh, uh-huh. my my average. And uh, yeah, we had um, we had a marching band, and she ended up moving uh, to Walton High School. Her name was Miss Smothers. Uh-huh. And um, she was the, uh, the the marching band teacher. And she went to Walton, and now she works there. I guess, the, well, Celia Cruz Music School. Yeah, sure, sure. And she was this, um, she was great. She was mad as well with me. Because <laughs> I graduated early, and she wanted me to go to Berkeley. But uh-huh. I, she wanted me to stay another year. Yeah. And I didn't want to do it. Sure. Yeah. Um. So since you since you played upright bass, did that mean you were also starting to play like, you know, electric bass, or did you ever did you get? I into tried, that? and I still tried. Yeah, I tried, and I got two bases bases on my house, and um, I haven't even like I've touched it during pre pandemic. I tried to relearn it, and uh, I had a teacher come into my class, and um, he. You know, he was teaching me, but then, you know, the whole pandemic happened. Mm-hmm. And, but I was more, I, I was weird. I was more comfortable with the upright than the electric. It was such a transition. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I could get that. Uh, um, so, do you remember, like, what was the first, like, show, like, concert that you went to? Oh, yeah. I, I would never forget it. <laughs> I will never forget it for two reasons. I remember it like like it was yesterday. Yeah. It was Fear Factory, nineteen ninety nine. Okay. The, at the Roseland Ballroom, I still got the ticket stuff. Wow. So I was so obsessed with Fear Factory because you know the metalheads in, in the school was like, yo, that that was the thing there. And so ninety two K Rock was announcing that they were playing the Roseland, and uh, they were playing the Roseland with Spine Shank, System of a Down, uh-huh. and Head PE. So I, I told my, I called my dad at Van Cogan Park, and I said, like, "Pop, can I go to the show to go see a Fear Factory? If it's okay with my mother, it's okay with if it's okay with your mother, it's okay with me." And I'm like, "Okay." So I, I told my mom, and my mom was like, "It's a, if it's okay with your dad, it's okay with me." So I'm like, "Mom, what you think?" <laughs> He's like, uh, "He said that." So I took that as a yes, and I I went. And um, I met up with my friends, and we got home really late. And mind you, I was like 14 at the time, really super late. And um, crazy enough, I I could say a story before this Fear Factory thing with music. And um, I got home late, and I I was on high because, wow, I got to see Fear Factory. I got to see live music. My heart was beating, and mosh pit and I got to stage dive and all that stuff when I came home my father whipped me because <laughs> he uh-huh. I didn't get the confirmation from either or uh-huh. 
and uh, that was crazy. But in seventh grade, Howard Stern had a uh, movie. Oh yeah, nineteen ninety. It was called Pri Private Parts, I believe. I remember that. Yep, yep, yep. So. My neighbor, my, my Guyanese neighbor, Clifford and his uncle, um, which is named Marcel, were like, they were going to the premiere. So they were like, yo, you want to come, blah, blah, blah. So I'm, I'm like a little kid. And, um, you know, my mom used to watch kind of Howard Stern a little bit. Uh -huh. But my mom doesn't know English or anything like that. My mom used to just call him gay because he looked kind of like... I don't know. My mom used to, that was just her thing. Yeah. And my dad used to watch it because my sister used to watch it. So like my parents were like, "Where you want to go?" I said, "They're going to the premiere." And then I made him come upstairs and tell them like, "Yeah, I'm going to take care of Sammy." Blah blah blah. This that and the fourth. My parents made my parents allow me to go, and um, I saw Marilyn Manson. I saw like all his instrument players. I saw Chris Cornell. Uh huh. You know, I saw all these stars. I listened. To, to Ozzy Osbourne, like I didn't watch, it was so far. Like Ozzy Osbourne performed a song, "Pictures of Matchstick Man," uh -huh. live, like near Madison Square Garden, and that was kind of the first live experience. But ah, my see. first show was that Fear Factory show. Wow, wow, um, and were you like um, aware? in high school i mean obviously there was your own circle but were you aware of like bronx bands or like you know live music happening in the bronx at all at that point oh yeah so i'll get to that story so in 99 i met i live in 170 so in 170 i'll get to that later with the the big the big dogs okay okay yeah. okay sure 170 i was coming out the train and I see this guy with a bass. Uh huh. And I'm like, oh, you playing a band? And he's like, yeah, I play in a band. And uh, where's the band? Where, where, where's the practice? Like, where? Oh, we call Moss. And I'm like, Moss? What that stands for? Man of some serious shit. So I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, man, I would want to check you guys out. So the kid name is Peter Calderon, who to this day I have him on Facebook. We haven't talked in years, but we're cool. You know? And um, you could come to our practice. I'm like, yeah, I would love to see that. So then um, I was like, yeah, cool. Um, so when it, when it, where is the practice? Oh, I live, uh, it's in Elliot. And I'm like, <laughs> so like, once someone else, I'm like, all right, cool. So I, I call him, I got his number, and then he invited me to go and uh, see this guy play guitar. His name is Greg. And then uh, they had the drummer. I forgot the name of the drummer. I think it was Wilton, Milt, Wilton. And then he came, and then Peter was playing the bass, and they were they had some songs. They had two singers, this guy named Tony and Steve, that used to call uh -huh. him Kiki, and uh, they had this other guy named Gary that passed. That was mm. friends with my friend Clifford. That went to that went to Walton. I see, I see, I see. But these guys like Greg, Greg, uh, Kiki, um, uh, Tony. They were like high school friends from Columbus High School, but they were kind of a little bit older than us, and they were kind of like dropouts. I see. But they, they were playing, so they started to get started to write songs, and then they started to practice in that little apartment, and then eventually, I think they went to Music Unlimited. Uh huh. Music Unlimited. Yeah. Yeah, on Pelham, and they started getting a little serious, and then we had this guy, man. Uh, who kind of helped us, well, helped them, Gio. Oh, Gio, for sure. Gio helped them, Gio's, Gio's like, helped them get on the show at the Black Thorn. Uh-huh, So uh -huh. that was my first thing of the Bronx thing, and I went in there, and I'm like, okay, this is not like Fear Factory, this is not like the big band, this is not, you know, mainstream, but this is local, this is cool, it's music, I, I, I don't care what it sounds like. Yeah. So I went in there. The first band I watched was um, Vic Twenty. Ah, okay, sure, sure. May he sure. rest in peace, John Morin, who was the singer. Uh huh. And funny enough, my neighbor's uh, really good friend, my and my co-op is really good friends with this guy that played in the band Vic Twenty. His name is uh, Scotty. Oh, and he, he Scotty played in Hellbound, I think, before Vic Twenty. Is that right? Yes. And yep. Yes. 
Scotty comes to the building sometimes where I live. Oh wow! Okay, and I was okay. like, hey, you know, uh, you know, you, I don't know, you remember me, you know, but I, I'm still trying to find the music. Um, I was not really into it, but it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, I used to laugh because the vocals and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. They played, and then this other band called Shaquan. Oh, Shaquan. Okay, sure, sure, sure. That um, the singer is still around. Um, what's his name? He played in one of Geo's bands. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I have him on Facebook. Mel, I Mel, think. Mel, Mel. Yep. Yeah. Mel was cool. I think he lives in Co-op City or something like that. Mel Riley. Yep. So, yeah, I saw his band. I liked his band, Shaquan. I thought they were co pretty good. And uh, it was really packed. That, that Black Thorn, oh, my God. I went there like, quite a few times. And they had this promoter. He was not that great. Nicky yes. Camp. Yes. He used to stiff all the bands. Uh-huh. And, um, yeah, that, that was the, once I saw that, I was like, wow, this is great. Bronx music. And then we have Bronx Net. Let me tell you, Ghetto Fest. Like, I used to watch that thing all the time because they used to throw, uh, they used to throw shows. Oh, on Bronx Net, really? Ghetto Fest, Chris Ghetto Fest, I know. Oh, man, I didn't realize that. Yeah, there was this kid named Stoney. Stoney lived on Marcy. Uh-huh. On one seven oh near Greg, like where, where all these the big dogs live, yeah, yeah, which yeah, I'll get yeah, to yeah. in a minute. And uh, Stoney used to throw, he used to host the part, uh, the Bronx Net, and he used to do some stupid skits, but they were all metalheads, and wow. they, and they used to wear like Deftone shirts and uh -huh. stuff like that. And I eventually went to school. Uh, some well, one of them went to. They were from Columbus, and they they uh, Columbus High School. One of them went to uh, Clinton for. A couple of them went to Clinton for like summer school, uh -huh. and um, I used to go to their ghetto fests. Um, they used to throw them in Manhattan, but it was like a Bronx thing. It was Bronx bands. Um, I forgot the name of the bands. Moss was on actually one of those um, festivals. Athletus, I believe, was oh, on. Athletus, okay. Chris, you know, Chris is from Riverdale as well. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we had that. So that's where like. Me, and my other friend, like my best friend Lewis, uh, we talk about that to this day. Like, we didn't meet during that time, but we talk about the Bronx Net, about Ghetto uh -huh. Fest, kind of being the stepping stone of like getting to where we we are now. Now. Oh, wow, wow. So, your first Black Thorn show and and the Ghetto Fest, all of this was happening when you're in high school. Yes, wow. I went to a couple of Ghetto Fests. I went to. I went to the one in, um, they, went, did, they did one Ghetto Fest around 34th Street. Okay. And then they did one around 58th, 9th Street. There was a studio there. I rem forgot the name of the studio. It was like, it's kind of far from the train. You got to walk a little yeah. bit. That was the last one they did. I, I remember that year, uh, de that year. I think it was 2001 because I ended up seeing um, Strife and CBGBs. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And, and I took a friend there. And um, Strife for CBGBs with um, God forbid was his first h real show, not like a ghetto fest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see. Wow. Um, so, aside from Blackthorn, were there other like venues in the Bronx that you remember from that time? There was another spot, but I don't really remember the name. Uh, well, I booked in the Bronx, but. Um, there was a spot before that that was like in the highway. Like, forgot the name of the spot. Four in the Chamber played there. Uh, so did um, a lot of these Bronx Bronx underground bands played there. Uh, but I forgot the name of the the venue. My friend Lewis knew the name. We talked about it a couple of months ago. There was okay, this yeah. specific venue that I remember there. But I do remember, uh, obviously, the Bronx Underground. Of course, yeah, yeah, And yeah. then um, my show that I booked in uh, Yankee Stadium in 2000, uh, near Yankee Stadium, like 161st, this club, Social Media. Vida, oh, sure, 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 sure. That Gio was booking there as well. Sure, yeah. I remember but him he, talking about that. Yeah, he booked there. Um, and what? Who, who was on the show that you booked there? I booked uh, CDC. Uh -huh. They're from um, Pennsylvania. I booked uh, Wings of Plague from California. I booked this band called For the Fallen Dreams. They were from Michigan. And then I stacked it with my uh, local bands, which was uh, Line of Scrimmage, Fatality, um, Face the Truth, 
I think Point Pleasant played. I'm not too sure. We're at, they were at the show, but I, I don't really remember if they played. But yeah, we we stacked it with our, our bands. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so is now the time when you want to want to get into like the big, the big dogs and first meeting them uh, in the Bronx, or that is that not not yet? Is that later? Well, after that. During Clinton, I was um, a couple of my friends. We were all new metal together, whatever. Yeah. So our, our first introduction to like underground music was at Candaria. Uh huh. You know, a couple of my friends didn't like them, and then my best fr- one of my best friends, Abraham, that plays in the band from the Bronx, that used to play in the band. Well, he still does, kind of. Well, he's yeah, he's still in the band. Raso Diada. We used to live in um, the other side of the Bronx, Third Ave. Uh huh. He sold me Candaria 300 um, Process of Self Development in ninth grade in the tenth grade. Oh wow! And he was not into it because of the jazz. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was into it, and I was into it because I saw Puya, the singer wearing a Candaria. I'm like, I want to check that out. So I got into that band. I got into God forbid. Then my friend, my Asian friend, started writing hate breed on his book uh-huh, bag. Uh-huh. So I was like, okay, what's that? And then um, he said, yo, just listen to WSOU. They play way better music than K-Rock. So I started listening to that. Then I started getting into like, um, that's how I got into real hardcore. Like, I see, I see. Listening okay, to I Seton see Hall that. and listening to um, hate breed, um, Candiria, um you know what was the band uh, from Buffalo? Um, I listened to like Overcast. Okay, sure. You know, sure. like bands like that. Um, we listened to Diecast, On Earth. Uh huh. Like early On Earth, Shadows Fall, and stuff like that. So that's when we started crossing over. So then, 2001, I w- I only knew like w- like I started getting into these local bands, but Eat Town was like. The band Moss, uh-huh, uh-huh. they were all into like new metal. Like obviously, they were into like the stuff I was into, but they liked E Town. So when I when I went to that house, they 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 they, they to Greg's house, you gotta check out E Town. So it was kind of wigger music, you know, and, 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 and you know, and I was like, wow, this this is great, you know, this is like fuck the world EP and Time to Shine album. I was like, wow, this is great. So. The, I was too broke to even go to see those shows. Yeah, sure, sure. So then um, one time, they were, Etan was playing at the Puerto Rican Day Parade, and that was my first underground show. And I went there, and I didn't even have the correct change to buy the tickets. I think it was like $8. Yeah. So I went all the way down to the wetlands to go buy this damn ticket because I was <laughs> poor. Uh-huh. And uh, I was like, I think I needed a dollar or two. I had like $6. I don't... I don't remember, and there was a guy there on the line. He said, "Hey, I'm here to buy fishbone tickets," and the guy was like, oh, "I'm buying Eaton on, on concrete tickets," and he's like, "Who's playing the bill?" And I was like, "I don't know, some band called Billy Club Sandwich, <laughs> Sworn Enemy, uh, Thirty Six Deli Fist, Full Blown Chaos, and uh, Eaton." I said, I, "I'm only there for Eaton. I don't care about the rest of those bands." <laughs> <laughs> so the guy was like, he was a big fishbone. I told Glenn the story, big fishbone um, um, fan. So he said, no, you gotta, you gotta make sure you show up really early for Billy Club Sandwich. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, cool. He's like, you know, you're gonna love him. So I get there and I see like all these hardcore kids, and I'm there by myself. And then I met a friend at the show. I actually. Um, made friends with a kid at that show and his brother he brought his baby brother at the time i think his brother must have been like i'm not gonna lie like 11 years old and he was wearing a slipknot shirt <laughs> and that was cool because i was like wow he's wearing a slipknot shirt you know and hit my, hit my, they're from the bronx uh-huh. they, they're called milton and Rand- their name are milton and randy so they were there and we were talking and they were talking to me and so i kind of stuck with them at the show and um, my friend Abraham from Harasso the other ev- uh-huh. eventually came because he liked the town, and we just saw violence. And I'm like, wow, this is the place where we need to be. Like, we just see the dude from Fit from the Autopsy, Fat Pat. Shout out to Fat Pat, beating the shit out of people with this Billy Club. <laughs> and um, Billy Club played, and I'm like, wow, this is great. 
I'm like, wow, like fuck E Town. Like the rest of the bill was like <laughs> good, you know. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, from, yeah. There was no skips, and um, I went home. That was 2001, and I'm like, man, when is the next one? So like, the internet was very hard back then That's to right. use. So I'm typing and I'm looking, and then I bump into the hardcore website, and then the, I discovered. Um, Castle Heights. Uh-huh. So then I was like, oh, they're going to play there again. So then I'm like, I got to go see them. And I went to go see the Fumbalon Chaos play that show. Uh-huh. And um, I went to Fumbalon Chaos's record release with the old singer, uh, Joey 12 Step, they call him. And um, I saw Billy Club, and I was so excited. I was like, wow. I felt like Billy Club was like, I felt like they were like above the world, like these new metal bands, you know, like you. You had to wait for them and stuff like that, but yep. like, but like, damn, I'm talking to Billy Club outside the door, you know, I and, know. and um, it was crazy because that show that I went to, it was Motley's first show with Billy Club Sandwich. Oh, okay, sure, sure, so sure. Motley was uh, that was his first time around because Motley was in a couple of other bands um, before. He was in um, I forgot the name of the other band that he was Five Minute Major. Uh huh. Which uh, there were he was there with members of uh, One Second Thought and um, everybody gets hurt. Like Tom Murphy was on drums on that band. Uh, One Second Thought um, guitarist. There were another brother band of um, Motley, you know. And then at that time, I started getting very close to Geo. Geo used to work at Army and Navy store, and Geo. Um, Every time we used to go there, like when we were in high school, we kind of already had a friendship with him. But Gio was like always encouraging us to play instruments or play a band. Yeah. G- Gio didn't care. Like, Gio was a death metal guy, but like, if you needed help to play in a band to start it up, he would. He would fill in the. Br- he would play guitar, bass, and he drums. He plays everything, I think, right? And then he was like, "Yeah, you guys want to play a show?" And said, "Oh, but we're not that good. Who cares? Just, just come on." And he would just bring out the best of you, like. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. He he's great. Absolutely. Yeah, he is. He is. Um, so, did you like? Is that how you got into like um, booking shows and all through Geo? Gio was like my mentor. Yeah. Uh, Gio was like my right hand man. He's the one who showed me the ropes. Um, I used to go to his shows, and he used to book a lot of death metal. But he did book hardcore. Yeah. And he booked post hardcore. Like he booked Point Pleasant. They were from the Bronx. Uh huh. And uh, he didn't care genres. Like some of these guys, like Point Pleasant, worked with him already on another band called BTC or just. The, the meeting point was that Army and Navy store. Like, we saw Gio. Gio wore his death metal shirts. It would be like, we were, Gio's working his shift, and we're just talking about music and shows. Yeah. The whole 10 hours. Wow. And, you know, like, he didn't care. He's like, just talked about music. And, okay, yeah, the practice is at this time. Or he would go Funkadelic. So, you know. He was busy every weekend. Gio was busy. He was booking at um, Castle. Um, he booked at Castle Heights. He booked at the Blackthorn. Uh-huh. He booked at the Red Zone. Um, I believe he booked the CBGBs. Um, so I would, you know, eventually I started doing his door, or he had me um, say, "Yo, go, go and start writing interviews on the notebook and just ask questions." And um, so I just started going to random bands, like to the, now th- in this day, they're like legends, like Death Before Dishonor. Wow. And I was like, hey, do you guys want to be on a compilation? Like, I know there's none of these bands that are there. And they're like, sure, here's a couple of free CDs and put this song on there. And um, then the local bands, like, um, we got, uh, Geo got through the discipline on there, which was great, you know. Um, yeah, it was a lot of things through Geo. Wow, um, and you know, you you mentioned Billy Club Sandwich. Uh, um, did you start meeting some of the other like um, big Bronx bands in the hardcore scene after Billy Club? Oh, yeah, I met uh, Four in the Chamber. I met them at a benefit show at, for Frank Collins. Uh, he's a member of the the of the Misfits. I met them. I met um, the the uh, Fahrenheit Four Fifty One. Cause they live in the area, uh huh. So they're from like Elliot, 
Frank still, I, I, I still believe he still lives there. Like a couple of years ago, I drove my car and I saw him around there. I used to take the train with him sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Uh, irate. Uh -huh. You know, uh, Phil used to live around, um, around our area. But I've known Phil for years. I met his wife. Actually, you know, it's a funny story. I met his his son's mother before I met uh, Phil. Oh, really? Okay. Because okay. she used to go to shows. Nidia? Uh-huh. She used to go to shows, and she used to dance. And, yeah, I met her at Castle Heights. And, yeah, she was she was bad at the pit. Yeah, she was she was dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> she was she was a tough cookie. Wow. And I met Phil. I met Yubi. Um... You know, I met um, Gormentis. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Gary, I think that's his name, right? It's Barry. Barry, yeah. Barry, Barry. yeah, Barry. He worked in um, he worked in um, Kennedy. That's right. And I played a really bad show one time, and he was there, and he gave me a Gormentis CD. But I met uh, the bass player, Lewis. Uh huh. Met him when I was in college, but he wasn't their bass player. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I met him right. in the college because I went to Queensboro Community College and yeah. I saw him on the train and I saw that he kind of... But then um, he messed with the Bronx bands for some reason. And uh, eventually he did join Gio's band. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, he did join Gorgamentis at one point. I guess he was from the Bronx. I don't I don't. I, I haven't talked to him in God knows how many years. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but yeah, yeah I, the Bronx bands... Um, Gorgamentis, um, Fahrenheit 451, District 9, they're from they're from the area too. That's right. Actually, I had a little history in 2000, right before I moved to Riverdale by, by Puerto Rican Mike. He gave me a history he because he lives in Arizona, but he came, you know, for that, for like a black and blue. And he said, uh -huh. yo, he said, who's out here, blah, 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 I want to chill. I said, me. He said, so he came to one seminar. I said, yo, give me a history. So he told, he showed me the spots where they practice, where they made the noise, where they, you know, the buildings and everything. It was so cool. I was like, wow. Obviously, District 9 is down the block, the school district. So that's, yeah, that's, how, he, that's how he told me he got the name and everything. And, um, yeah, I was like, wow, I had these legends living right next to me, like, all this time. And too bad I was in, like, in high school. I didn't get into hardcore. You know, my path would have been different. But, you know, it everything you know happens for a reason yeah yeah that's right that's right and the timing might not have worked out really anyway because like fahrenheit probably broke up for the first time when you're in high school and district nine was kind of off and on at that point anyway yeah so. i probably would have like like one of my fr my new metal friends didn't even um know about them and i actually met freddie madball when i was in high school and um, I didn't even know he was Freddie Madball. Oh, how'd you meet him? And it was crazy. I was taking the four train to Marshallu. That's where okay. Clinton is. And I lived, obviously. And then um, um, he was there he was sitting across from me. And he comes up to me and and he comes up to me. He's like, yo, you, you know, and he came out of jail or something. Yeah. At that time, he said, yo, you into hardcore? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm just like, nah, I'm not into hardcore. But he said, can I give, I don't know what it is. He said, give me, give, you, give me your notebook. And he took a pen and started writing all these bands. And um, then he signed it in the bottom. I wish I would have never thrown it. And oh, he said, man. Because he lived in the Bronx at one point. Oh, I didn't realize that. He lived okay. in 183rd, and he wrote his name, Freddie Madball. And he said, Madball, a, a sick of all, a Gnostic front, you know, um, killing time, and all those bands that I, later on I got into. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So when I told my friends about it, like my new metal friend, Rev, um, yeah, I met some guy with hairy arms and like, he had hairy arms and, you know, he, he was like Spanish looking and he told me to check these bands out and I gave him the notebook and I showed him like, bro, you met Freddie Mabo and you didn't say anything? I'm like, because <laughs> they kind of knew but they kind of kept it inside house. Yeah, sure. They didn't kind of like, they were a little selfish, you know, at towards the tail end of our friends. We're still friends, but, like, they didn't, like, really, t oh, hey, check this band out. I see. So, then, like, yeah, I met the guy named Freddie Madball. I was like, wow, you stupid. Like, why didn't you have a kind? <laughs> it was crazy. That's crazy. Damn. I, it, yeah, it'd be awesome if you still had that paper. Yeah. Man. I have the ticket stubs of the shows. Yeah. You know, and then, um, you know, I met Carly Coma a few times. Uh-huh. Um met him, I met um 
the guy from Biohazard, Evan. Uh huh. Very nice guy. And um, I remember seeing them. The, the uh, VOD played uh, the Hammerstein Ballroom with God Forbid and Cradle of Filth. Oh, okay, okay. Wow. And uh, I didn't have any tickets, and I was uh, out there like on some broke shit. And he just came out and he said, "Here." Wow. And he gave it to me. He signed it. I still have it. But then you know, like going to shows and then learning a lot from Geo. Geo was like really instrumental. I booked my first shows with him. I booked. Um, I booked a show in Pennsylvania. Okay, wow. With I took the Bronx band, uh, Four in the Chamber. Uh-huh. I brought this band called Tomorrow's Victim from Queens. Uh, My Better Uh They were from um, the Hudson Valley. I took like these bands that Gio was booking, and uh, we were booking together. And I said, "Oh, I want to book a show in PA," but I didn't know any, I only knew one band. And my brother, who doesn't like hardcore or anything like that. So check this band out. They're called October Skyline from Pennsylvania. And I'm like, wow, I became obsessed with it. It's like grind and it's metalcore. Yeah. So I became cool with them online and uh, I booked a show, my first show there. Then I booked one, my first real show in the Bronx was the Black Dog, I mean, not in the Bronx, in Queens, uh-huh. Red Zone, was the Black Dahlia Murder. Uh, with um, Path of Terror, which was like members of uh, Fumbo and Chaos, Ray, other band, uh, this band called Arson, uh, Set of Blaze, and Swear to God. Okay. It was like the most weirdest mix. And Black yeah. Dahlia was coming off that um, on Hollow, they, they, their first record. Oh, okay. So, wow. Wow. Me and Gio booked the show. Their guarantee was like $75 each. We didn't mean it because yeah. it was 25 pe- pe- people there. And I was like, oh my God, it's going to be bad. And uh, the band was so grateful. We gave them 50 bucks or something like that. Then after that, I booked another show, which was really bad. Um, I started, you know, the second show I booked was Evergreen Terrace, On Broken Wings, Remember and Never, and Scarlet. And uh, disclaimer to, to all you guys who book shows. Never book a show without backup money. <laughs> and that show was horrible. Then after that, I took a break. And then I went back and I booked a show in Zone 13 with October Skyline, Raso the other, and a couple of other bands. Then I started getting a little better booking the shows and having backup money. Actually having a job. I used to work at the Limelight. Oh, okay, okay, okay. What did you do there? I was a busboy. Okay, okay, sure. So then um, there I started booking shows. Um... I started booking shows at the Red Zone a lot, and I was working with um, Mary, who used to book at the Red Zone. So she used to book shows. So I used to like throw bands under her and say, "Look, let's get these bands on the show." Uh-huh. Blah blah blah. Then the Red Zone kind of fizzled out. Then I um, ended up booking shows in Greenpoint with my ex business partner. I owned a record label. Uh-huh. It was a Bronx Bronx record label, Bronx Brooklyn label. What's the name? What was the name of it? On the Attack Records. Oh, On the Attack Records. Okay, okay, okay. So we wanted to do like this Bronx, Brooklyn thing, and um, it, it worked for years. We 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 did pull out a lot of music. We put out bands from you know all over, and um, so we were booking in Greenpoint. We were booking um, in Staten Island, this place called wow. Dock Street. Uh, we were booking even um, Don Hills. I had to go through Nikki Camp. It was not a good experience, but yeah, I bet. you know, with him. And then um, I did the Pyramid Club. Oh, oh before, uh, yeah, I forgot about that. The Pyramid Club was great. Then that kind of died out. And um, you know, the most place that I booked the most it was the Red Zone. Okay, okay, that's the, the Red Zone to the most, huh? Yeah, it was the Red Zone that I booked the most. But then I, everybody's like, "Yo, you booked all the boroughs, but you haven't booked here." <laughs> and it was hard. It was of course, and not a whole lot of places to book. So I was like, okay, I got this package, and it was um, uh, CDC. Uh huh. It was uh, CDC uh, through uh, CDC and Windsor Plague and the other band um, that came, and they were like, yo, we need a venue. So uh, somebody was like, yo, Club Social Vida. They're starting to do shows there. So we were like, all right. I hit them up. Ended up getting the show. 
and it packed. It packed, and it was like, wow, it was like 500 kids there. Like, wow. Even kids that go to the red zone, like, came down because obviously the bands were great, but. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were yeah. like, wow, we haven't seen something in the Bronx and got, we, you know, they usually get the Bronx on the ground. Yeah, sure. It's not like real hardcore bands. Yeah. They're like, wow, you know, like, so we had a show there, and we had all kinds of walks. We had Face the Truth playing there. They were like, the singer was Crip, he passed away. Um, it was so urban. There was then there was a kid there who was uh, who played in one of the bands, not, yeah. but he didn't play the show. He he's he did a documentary of the sh of the show. Oh, okay, okay. It's called the Brown, the Blue, the Black. I'll send it to you. Oh later. yeah, send it to me. Wow. So he documented, Shit. you know, what it is to have you know music in the Bronx and stuff like that and urban. So this kid filmed there and he was doing interviews and. Um, Documenting all the bands that that, that that played the show, and um, it was great. Like the owners didn't like it; they shut it down. I bet. I bet. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> it what shut down. This? Like if you see the the documentary, you'll see it for a minute, and you're like, oh, they shut the music down. But then um, it kept going. I kept telling them, don't worry, this is what we do. Don't we just punch each other in the face? Yeah. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, we're friends. Yeah. And he was like, he wasn't having it. He was a hood guy. So then um. Towards the tail end of the show, wins a plague play, <laughs> and uh, you know they're not they're a heavy band, but they yeah. got a lot of piano and stuff like That's that. Right, yeah, the guy was so amazed about the band that in the middle of the set, like when they stopped, he said, "Hold on a second. He came down, he grabbed the mic, and he's like, "This is an effing band <laughs> to like the <a> crowd. <laughs> this is a good band. This is a great band." And he's like. He's like, give them beer. And they're like, they all have X's on their hand because they straight edge. And we're like, we don't drink. He's like, no. giving them buckets of beer and oh stuff like that. Gosh. And I'm like, we were just laughing. We're like, wow, you know, he calmed down, you know, like he, you know, he got it, you know. <laughs> but it was, it was a great night and like everybody was so excited. And to this day, that's like the most talked thing that I did. Like, wow, man, you brought something to the Bronx and something that we needed because. Yeah, we have FOC, but yep. FOC was more catered to, like, it was kind of like kid-friendly shows, like, they were doing a good thing, you know, but they were doing, they, they did a very great thing, um, but they were, like, more sheltering the... That's the, right. Then, like, you're having this underground, aggressive music, plus um, friends, like, like, Johnny Cage is a fake, Gigi's band, right? They were from the Bronx. Those kind of bands would not fit in in the X F L C crowd. That's I mean, right. even though they will book them, yeah. But the moment you know chaos breaks off, like people are beating the shit out of each other, they don't. Yep. So my show allowed people to do that, and um, they were like, "Man, book more!" And then you know we we weren't able to book more at social club social media. What what year was that show? Two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. I think two thousand six, two thousand seven. I gotta look at the the YouTube. I, yeah. thought, I thought I sent it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably did. I just don't remember the year off the top of my head. Brown, black, um, blue. Yeah, Fatality. Like that was. I had uh, Fatality on there. Uh, there were on my record label. Um, a lot of these bands that I had on my record label, I wanted them to be on my label because of th how we connected. We being minorities. Absolutely. And we didn't have any money, and they didn't have any money. Uh -huh. Like, they didn't have any money to even like play shows, like uh, bring instruments, you know. Like, so like I wanted to like help them get their jump start. So me and Jay, who is the other guy who owned the record label, who yeah. now owns to the point, we would get them jump started like by paying for the recordings, paying for the artworks. Wow. We had Line of Scrimmage, we had bands from Puerto Rico. I had a lot of Christian bands that I, I put out. Yeah. I had bands from like Germany, uh called Fall Brawl. I had bands from Paris called wow. Providence. I did splits. You know, I had distribution all around the world. Like Monty went to Japan and he was like, yo Sam, like I thought I was I mean I was under the red here. Like yeah. I wasn't making any money. I was doing it for the love of. He said, yo, I went to Japan, bro. I saw a whole section of your stuff saying like Bronx hardcore, like New York hardcore label. And I'm like, wow, I was so happy because I'm like, wow. I never seen that here, you know? And it was so hard to get your stuff on record stores. 
Absolutely. Like um, Generation Records, I would go there as a, hey, you want some? You want to buy two? Uh, here, have it for free. And they're like, no, you know, but to see that, uh, you know, for my tiny little mom, for my mom's apartment, starting that record label. And then uh, my mom's like, yo, you better get your shit out and move into <laughs> Cube Smart. <laughs> and, and putting all my records in Cube Smart wow. CDs and then moving to my apartment and just doing it for my apartment. You know? Wow. So I did that record label from 2005 to like 2012. Wow. And where, um, where would bands like, did you have a spot that you'd send bands mm -hmm. to like record or? Whatever they wanted. To wherever do. they wanted. Okay. But there were certain bands on my record label like Fatality. Yeah. And uh, way to the crown. More Fatality recorded with Len Carmichael um, that played in a lot of bands. And he does a podcast with um, Mutley. Oh, their podcast. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. Len Carmichael is an engineer, sound engineer. He works for This Is Hardcore. I met him. He was one of the first guys that I met at Castle Heights when he played in his other band called Breath of Silence. So I kind of kept a little relationship with Len. Yeah. And he was recording bands, and um, I was like, wow, I like your production. And um, I mean, I didn't have so much money, I mean, like, to pay for the recordings. So Len was like, oh, I, I love Fatality. I record them for like $800, full length. And we're like, wow. let's go. And he recorded them, and he made the best out of them. Yeah. And uh, that's why I like Len, because Len would take a band like, Wig of the Crown, who didn't really had the talent, but he made them shine in the studio. Uh -huh. And then after we recorded that record, he made them better musicians after they left. Wow. So like most of the bands, they used to, um, they used to like, they had their own guy in the band. There's usually one guy in the band that records, or they were like, we have a place, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it, just give us more CDs. We had different arrangements with different bands. Sure, sure. What was the first band that you signed to your label? Do you remember? Oh uh, yes, it was called Blood of the Martyr, and they were broken up. They were from Erie, Pennsylvania, and uh, I put them out. I was so obsessed with that band, even though they were broken up. I just put them out because I just wanted to put them out, and they were a Christian band, um, and I ended up getting them, and well, getting him because it was like the band broke up i see yeah and I, I thought later on i thought it was a bad investment but you know it was like i popped my cherry yeah and then you know i got a little bit more serious with the second band which is kind of scrimmage and then i signed after them i think fatality and uh it went on from there there was another band that i signed later on on stable foundation which is dave oh okay yeah yeah from yeah, yeah, from, yeah, yeah, yeah. from four in the chamber from four in the chamber apparition extinguished the code i signed uh -huh, his uh -huh. that was jay jay my uh -huh. my business partner signed them it didn't go too far yet. yeah they didn't play much yeah but um yeah we did a lot of projects and um we were aiming for like bronx bands like we were trying to see if kids develop but like we didn't have a venue absolutely hard to do that without a venue yeah like that's what was that was his goal jay and my goal because we really had the brooklyn band we had on scrimmage uh-huh fatality was more the harlem band yeah and um because they were from harlem and one of them was the uh, two of them were from staten island and one was from bay ridge oh okay okay i see but um yeah that's where we were aiming for because i had the the bronx had a lot of metal, a lot of hardcore kids. We used to go to shows together. I mean, we had the band Regained the Heart Condemned. They were from the Bronx. Yeah, they're all from the Bronx. Yeah. But they came out around that time where 2006, seven. I was in that band at one point. Uh huh. And, um, but yeah, we were trying to get something going, you know, in the Bronx. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I already, like, kind of know the answer to this because I was, you know, uh, I was into hardcore at the same time. But for, you know, maybe people who are younger or maybe years later listen to this, like, why don't you talk a little bit about, like, what was the hardcore scene like, like, in, you know, 2005 through 2012? Like, what, 
what was the kind, what were some of the like trends in the scene and things like that? What did it sound like? Well, we had a, a 2005. Uh, we had like a little era of beatdown. We had like the beatdown thing going, and then um, you know we had bands like Budos that came back around. So you had bands like Guy and Scrimmage. I was signing a lot of bands like that, like kind of like uh, a band called Hitless that I signed from St. Louis that sounded like nothing but beatdown uh -huh, and stuff like uh -huh. that. But then around like eight, nine, we started getting traditional hardcore bands, like, you know, like, um, not really uh, like backtrack uh, bands like that, um, that sounded more traditional, like less breakdowns and um, fatality uh, members of that band, they formed a new band called Mind Peace. That sounded like they had to share terror sound, uh -huh. you know, and it was like that, kids were gravitating towards more so booking those kind of shows were kind of hard because you know now that's a different scene in its own you gotta like those guys don't want to commingle with like all oh, these meatheads like uh -huh. you know like us like you know but we were getting into that stuff too we were yeah, like right. going we you know we started you know we were going back we were listening to killing time and stuff like that we we're going to killing time shows and you know like Killing Time to this day, they play with anybody. Yeah. And yeah. They, they play, you know, they still sound amazing. They're like one of my favorite bands. And um, Floor Punch. Uh-huh. And um, we, that's kind of like, in that era, uh, the, the, from 2005 to like 12 was kind of a weird era. Yeah, yeah, it because is. Because uh, of the bands, the touring was big, um, but the bands, like, some of the New York bands, it was really hard to be in a band in New York City. Uh, the reason why, because if you tour, you lose your job, or uh huh. And, um, I'm not, you know, even if you live with your parents, it's not like if you're living in Long Island, you're living in a private house or something like that. Studio was very expensive for, for people who didn't have a job. A lot of my friends who are from the Bronx or from Harlem, mainly the Bronx, we didn't get our shit together till like we were like in our mid 20s, uh huh, uh huh. Like, we were doing the show stuff, we were going to shows, we were attending shows, like, we had to spot each other, we always took care of each other, like, yeah, because we grew up, a lot of us grew up with no money, like, a lot of my friends gave them the projects, uh -huh. you know, like, you know, it was kind of hard to get a job, so me, working at Avalon, I got all my hard, a lot of my hardcore friends a job, uh -huh. so we kind of had, um, we worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like, one of my friends at the time, Oscar, worked it because it was, it was like gay night at that time in and, 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 and Avalon, so there was like a gay day, and he was like the head busboy, but we sacrificed a lot working there because we couldn't go to Fridays or Saturday shows. I see, yep, yep. But we would go to Rich Hall shows on Sundays, uh -huh. we, the bangers, and like, it was really hard for us to like, yo... We only work two days a week, uh, most of us. Like my friend Lewis, um, my other friend um, Angel, uh, this other kid named Daniel worked there with me, Danny. Um, um, Ruben, he was from the Bronx. We all four of us worked there together, like at one point. So, like, we couldn't do Friday, we couldn't do Saturday. We had a little, we, okay, we all going to CBGB's. You know, together. Oh, we going to your show, the Red uh -huh. Zone. So my shows were like always on a Sunday. I or see. sometimes during the week when I used to book at Nikki and Sam's. Yeah. Tuesdays and Sundays. I see. Or I Wednesdays see. or stuff like that. You know. Um. So it was it, it was kind of hard. Like I, I, you know, I. 2005. You know, we had some peaks. You know, like the 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 peak was you know, last minute Hellfest canceled. Uh huh. So then uh, I get a phone call from Monomosity, one of the bands, and this band called Embrace the End. Hey, uh, Sam, I know you like, this is like, we dropping this to you last minute, but we dropping this to you on last minute. Will you be interested in playing, uh, having us play at CBGB's? And you booked the show. I'm like, dude, it's like, when is the show? We're like, like tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, you want me to book a show tomorrow? And I'm like, what can I get? So I started calling all those ba my, those bands. I like, yo, 
we got a show with so and so. You guys are interested in playing? And I called the band, one of the bands on my record label from Pennsylvania. And they're like, oh, me and we work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. F work. It's CBGBs. Uh huh. And we packed it. All the wow. Bronx kids, all the the Harlem kids. It was like three hundred something people. Wow. And asked me in the show by MySpace bulletins. Wow. Yeah, MySpace. Yes. For sure. For sure. Yeah, we had Fatality. We had uh, Fatality. We had Point Pleasant. I had my Jersey local band away from it all. Face the Truth played. Uh huh. It was it was historic. Like that was one of my highlights that year, and. Um, I had a really good time. I didn't make money. I didn't do this to make money at book shows. But like, I, all I cared about was people having a smile and sure. talking about it afterwards. Sure. When you booked your shows, um, would you have to like work the door and work security and all too? Would you get other people to do that? I would work the door sometimes. Um, I would have one of my homegirls do the door. The security, I had to pay. Sometimes... Um, I'll have naughty boys that would break things in the venue. Like, <laughs> yep. Ruben. And I was like, Ruben, now you're working security. <laughs> he had no money to pay, pay for the glass door yeah, that he broke. Yeah, 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 sure. So Ruben had to work the do um, security for all the shows at Nikki and Sam's, which was near um, the Knitting Factory. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, and, sure. So I had that venue. So we made him work security. And um, yeah, we had to pay sometimes. Yeah, we, we definitely had to pay uh, a little hundred dollars, one fifty uh -huh. or one hundred and fifty for the sound. Yep, you know, um, a lot of times. Wow. Um, and uh, I know you've mentioned a couple times, like the FLC, like the Bronx Underground shows. Did you go to those very much? I went to a few of them. Yeah, I went to. Um, this Bronx band, they were pretty good. They were a post-hardcore band called Turns to Fall. Oh, okay. I heard the, 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 the guy, Mike Costello, had a brother that played in another band that passed away. Um, I went there uh, quite a few times uh, to see them. And I think, yeah, I went to go see the record release party. And I went there like two or three times there. It was nice, you know. They, they, had, a, they had a pretty nice crowd. And, you know, they had a pretty big crowd. Like... Maybe like 400. Yeah. You know, that they, they did book Billy Club, you know. They did book, because um, my boys, my boys, my, my one of my friends, Fernando, went. They booked a mirror. You know, we'll book one heavy band, like Once in a Blue. Once in a Blue Moon, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then, you know, shit would get real and... They yeah, wouldn't book any other band for no a like, <laughs> and imagine the one show that I went to, they shut it down. It was like there was a band, uh, The Miracle of You. They were like on Hot Foot Records, and they were like my first time ever listening to them. Yeah, and the singer of that band called me out because I was wearing a No Innocent Victim hoodie. It was uh -huh. like, like, oh, that dude with the No Innocent Victim hoodie. It was a Christian band. And he was like. You know, and he wanted me. He was trying to do a mosh call, and um, I was dancing and stuff like that. And there was a big fight for that. And I'm like, that's kind of like a post-hardcore band, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they shut it down. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, you know, after after you decided to like stop with your record label, um, were were you still in the scene? Yeah. After that, yeah. Why don't you talk about the years after the record label? I tried after the year of the record label. I, my wife was like, "You got to get rid of it because you're, you know, you're not making any money." So I got rid of it. I mean, I sold, I sold, gave, donated, whatever. I still have tons of CDs of another band on my house. I tried again, like I think 2014, I believe it okay, was. Okay. Okay. To book a show, I haven't booked a show in God knows how long. And when I booked the show, I thought I had the juice, you know, and <laughs> I showed it terrible. It was at the place bar, the Kingsland. Oh, I see, I see, I see. It, they used to call it the place bar. Yeah, yeah. So Jay was like, my friend who owns the, uh, who used to own the record label, he's like, Sam, I could get you the place bar for free. Just pay the sound. I was like, how bad could it be, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. right. So how much the sound guy wants? $300. I'm like, all right, that's, that's not bad. The package wants 400 bucks. $700. How bad can it be? Bro, like seven people paid. 
Oh man, it was bad. And I had the I had Dave's band there. Oh, apparition. Oh, apparition. Okay, okay. And this okay. other band called Vice that now they become they became combust. Okay, okay. they're pretty exposed. They're yeah. pre uh, that band now. And I was like, man, there's no way I'm gonna lose. And then my wife was like, man, you lost everything. You lost three hundred dollars. <laughs> wow. Seven people paid. And, wow. Uh, yeah, I was like, nah. So then I just kept going to shows. Yeah. Then in 2015, I think it was 2015, I connected with my friend, uh, Seven Angels, Seven Plagues, Matt Matera. Uh huh. And I was like, man, like I would love a shirt of your band. Um, but I want to pay these crazy prices, so I was like, "Yo, let's let's reprint them." So we're like, "Okay, we did one. We did one shirt, and then it went well. We sold them, but it yeah. was not the best quality. So we're like, now we got to print with better quality." So yeah. I got into this reprinting thing. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So I started reprinting bands, um, um, like big bands, like Kickback, Seven Angels, Red Line, Spirit of God, Prayer for Cleansing. So, I did this all on Facebook, and um, I was like one of the first guys doing this on the hardcore scene. Like, uh, I see. And um, we were printing with bands, connecting with them, and um, I didn't expect this to grow big. Yeah. And, and, and it, it grew big. Like my, I, I was on a page on Facebook with it's called our OG Merch Swap, and they would not let you like request shirts of bands that you wanted so they would kick you out the swap so i got mad and i'm like this is terrible i'm gonna start my own group and i started my own group and it started with like me by myself and like a couple of people and then i was like yo people started joining it looking for this shirt looking for that shirt looking for this shirt looking for that shirt looking for this shirt so then i was like oh let's print and i started printing and Yo, kids were just not having it because I was like devaluing their OG shirts. <laughs> and kids was just, it was it was a really great time. Like yo, it was like one of the best times I had on Facebook. And then I make I made connections with those kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of those kids, you know, playing bands now. Because of those kids, I'm actually going to Orlando, Florida, like with EGH, and. Um, you know, it was it was cool. You know, then everybody st jumped on the trend of doing it, and I got out before you know it got bad. Uh huh. I see. I see. I see. So I didn't like lose money or or anything like that. You know, and I used to take the profits and donate to like Under Oath, like the the original singer of Under Oath. Yeah, sure. He had a really bad ATV accident. Mm -hmm. Um, don't you know, sworn enemy uh, drummer died, pulling no neck. So I used to take my profits and just donate it to that, or just kick it back into the, the shirt business. Sure, sure. So yeah, it was. I was very um, in tune. Still am in tune with the scene. Still go to shows. Still buy a lot of CDs. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I still go on Bandcamp. Uh huh. And buy, you know, on Bandcamp and yep. vinyl and, you know, I always say I'm not gonna go. I go to a show and. I go to a show and I'm like I'm not spending anything. <laughs> Forget about it every time. And then I'm at the show and my friend I'm like my friend is with me. He's like, "Yo, I bought the CD. I bought that." <laughs> my friend's the same way. My friends, my friend Lewis is into CDs, so yeah. he he's like, "Bro, like, where's the where's your car keys?" I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then my, I come home. My wife is like, "More crap," and I'm like, "Yes, <laughs> more shirts you're not gonna wear." <laughs> Obviously, you know, you know, I'm not wearing a bad shirt. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <laughs> but I, that's my way of supporting. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. These bands gotta eat. You know, I remember being poor, and I mean, not poor, but not having the money to buy it. Now, yeah. you know, like I, I f it feels good that you support a musician. They don't make money. That's right. That's right. I know. You know. I know. And it's five. Sometimes it's four. You yeah. know. Then you got road expenses, especially with a van. So, you know, that's my way of supporting and. um going to shows or um doing merch like now i do merch for everybody gets hurt you know um friends with them for the longest like 20 plus years did you meet them at castle heights yes yeah i met them at castle heights i was a a, a late bloomer in castle heights i were, was in castle heights from 2001 to 2003 it shut down but you know, um, I was there every Friday. John the Doorman, shout out to John the Doorman. 
He knew I was poor. <laughs> he used to get me in. Then it con the path continued red zone, so I got my shit together. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, I used to go there Fridays or Sundays. They used to throw uh, shows there. Um, Kevin Castle had maybe Saturday a different genre or something like that. Yeah. But Gio used to book there too. Uh huh. Uh huh. So Gio used to book some shows there. Um, he even, Gio even booked during the week. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, now, before I ask you more about everybody gets hurt, um, one of the things that I think you hinted at that I'm, you know, would like to hear some more about uh, with your record label um, about how you know you support bands just getting started. One of the things uh, that I guess it'd be you know the generation, you know, people like maybe five years older than you in the Bronx scene. Uh, you know, were really into was the the Boogie Down crew, and they kind of had a similar setup where, you know, bands would share instruments and things like the the Bronx bands would share instruments and all. Um, was there that kind of setup with the record label? Did the the bands like share instruments even and yeah like that? I, I will mention it really big here. <laughs> Fatality for a while they and and I know they're gonna listen to this, but for a while, boy, you guys didn't have no drum set and uh -huh. they were poor so uh -huh, they, uh -huh. they didn't have a cab and the backing band was like line of scrimmage just one chance and yeah we did um and sometimes i arranged that you know uh -huh. i'm like okay you bring the guitar cab you bring another one you bring the drum set okay you bring the cymbals because you know it was hard you know like most of these kids didn't drive especially right. fatality the guitarist drove and he lived in staten island <laughs> <laughs> so he would drive his guitar cab and uh, he would drive to the show but the members would take the train uh -huh. so like I remember a lot of the times when I was um, hanging out with Moss and they would play Castle they play Castle Heights a few times I would carry the cabinet <laughs> on the on the four train take it to Times Square uh -huh. roll it all the way down to the seven train and I'm like, and then we're rolling that thing. I'm like, oh, this thing is heavy. I don't even think it had, t wait, I don't even think it had t tires. So you're just like lugging it. Lugging it, yep. It would be me and another showgoer, uh, this kid, Miguel, like one of their friend, one of the, our mutual friends, girls would come. So it was heavy. And then doing it, going home. Uh huh. And it was like, at like 3 a.m. <laughs> and then going up their stairs. To their house and bringing it up because he lived in the third floor walk up <laughs> and it was it was a mess like we the, man we were, it was bad but the sharing of the instruments were you know it helped too yeah because, absolutely but you know like there was shows that i booked that the drummers would be like all five bands all the drummers had their stuff outside and they didn't like sharing the equipment because a lot of the drummers were like, oh, they want to play to their, their style, their kit. But now you see that in a lot of shows that now there is a house drum set. That's right. Like the Monarch, you know, the Meadows, um, the Kingsland, you know. But a lot of my band, like everybody gets hurt. They always worried about that. I'm like, bro, like you guys are stuck in like Castle Heights. Like everything is backline most of the time. Don't uh -huh. worry, I'll get it under control, you know, because. I'm the one who speaks to the promoter and I, I make sure everything is back. Okay, what do you want us to bring and stuff like that. They do get panicky, but you know, they're professionals. They just want to sound tight. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and it's interesting you brought up the part about, you know, bringing heavy musical equipment up and down subway stairs because that's something people always talk about too. I mean, it's a reality of being a musician in New York, I guess. And then the thing, the whole deal was with um, Black Thorn. Uh, he will give you I think the shows were like seven dollars. So you had to reach 20 heads to get two dollars uh -huh. So like you had a battle between Shaquan and you got a battle between um, Aphilis Aphilis had a little crowd going uh, You know and you got to make sure like when you go to the show that like, you'll say say most at the door say uh -huh. most. But uh -huh. sometimes that that person at the door is friends with everybody. That's right absolutely and, and then you know that friend would be like oh can i see the sheet and you know a lot of kids used to tell me that when i used to do the mm -hmm. door can mm -hmm. i see your sheet mm -hmm. okay save for him for this band uh-huh but i didn't work that way you know yeah 
a lot of my bands knew that it, there was no money involved yeah, in this. Sure. And when I booked the show, like, the guarantees would go to the headliners. Unless it was like Billy Club or something like that. Yeah, sure. Billy Club would play and they're like, okay, we need a hundred dollars, you know, okay, we'll make that happen. Um, yeah. But like, my little crew of bands, they just wanted to see that band like travel. And Absolutely. The, the bands that used to travel from, in, they have a band from Indiana called Blood In, Blood Out. They would travel all the way from Indiana to play for me for $200. Ooh, wow. Just because they loved New York and they loved me. And I was like, hey, I need you guys on a show next month, two months from now. Okay. Wow. And they paid them and um, they were like, you're crazy. You pay us right before we go on. I was like, the show is not going to do well today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after going through that horrific experience with uh, with with Evergreen Terrace and Mar Unbroken Wings, I, I never wanted that experience again. So I always had Absolutely. my backup money. Absolutely. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Wow. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about what your most recent experience with Everybody Gets Hurt was like? Oh, wow. Well, there's a lot of experiences. The first experience was um, just seeing them um, before the festivals this January, just seeing them on the flyer. Uh -huh. And um, I had Rob's number, the singer, and um, I'm wondering if it was still the same number. So I'm like, hey, I see that you guys are on FYA Fest in Florida. And he responded really quick. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, Sam, we're on it. I said, hey, if you want me to do merch again, because I did merch on one of the last show, actually the last show. Oh, okay, okay, he, okay. He called me and he said, like, I want you to run the door. And, I mean, run the merch. And because one time they played, uh, I forgot, no, not one time. Was it one time? No, no. Oh, no, no, he just randomly called me to do the merch. Okay, okay, yeah, It yeah, was yeah. the show that they were going to play. They played the last show in 2016 at Club Reverb. So then um, that day, I was like, you guys got a lot of shit here. And you guys don't know what you got here. Like, you guys didn't sell anything. Like, give me this stuff. <laughs> and it was like, well, what are you going to do with it? I said, don't worry, I'll do something with it. And I went on Facebook on my group page. Uh-huh. Okay, I got everybody gets hurt merch, and boom, 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 boom. Everybody started buying. Wow. And I sold it all. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, yo, you crazy. I, I made like 5,000 bucks. Oh my God, wow. So they came down to the Bronx, and I'm like, okay, I, I'm gonna do, I did you the favor, and yeah. you're gonna do the favor with me to drop them off to the post office. Uh huh. So then, um, that was the last of the show that they played, and then um, they broke up for a while. And they came back, and then I asked them, like, hey, I'll be interested in doing your merch again. And um, I know people that print, so um, I got hooked up with Soaking and Printing. Um, wonderful company. I recommend them for anybody. Yeah. Um, the guy gave us a really good discount because we were playing the FYA and he was a sponsor. Uh -huh. And not only that, he drove the merch to the fest. Wow. So we didn't have to pay for any uh, shipping. Oh my God, wow. So I went over there and I went to a practice. Rob gave me some of his little stuff. I got rid of it and um, helped the band purchase a plane ticket uh, for Chris B with it and uh they were able to play so then we went to fya fest i was like i i made the order of a hundred and uh a hundred and one t-shirts 51 hoodies no 152 shirts no 100 no like 200 shirts yeah and like 51 hoodies i'm like okay i'm praying to god and i brought you know like that this thing sells because I don't want to come home with it because they don't know what to do. Uh huh. <laughs> Your wife won't be happy. <laughs> my wife wasn't be happy either. So my wife was there. We were there. We was we were there at sitting at the table, and the line the door is open, and boom! I see a line. I'm like, oh my god! And she's there, and we like, oh man! Like I'm there with my phone because now it's PayPal uh -huh. and Venmo uh -huh. and all this uh -huh. and Zelle and this. So she's there, she's busting it out, and I'm busting it out, and we, 
the show kind of comes down to an end. I'm like, okay, so how did we do today? I said, well, we made $8,800. Wow. And then it's like, only got two mediums left. Oh, my God. And wow. a small box of CDs. <laughs> wow. And they were like, wow, that was so blown away. And uh, it was such a great response. They're like, run it back. You know, so I started reprinting them, their merch, selling it online. You know, I create some structure for them. Like, uh, they play the show in Brooklyn. I did the merch there with my spouse. Yeah. You know, they play the show in New Jersey. I did the merch there. And then uh, they, we got invited um, to Glasgow. That was kind of random. Yeah, they got they got in, um, they got invited. The Glasgow thing came out randomly. Actually, came out of a T-shirt sale. Okay. Because the kid, this guy, um, I was selling Chris B's merch and uh, rare merch online on 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 Instagram, and this kid was like, "Hey, would you be interested in playing Glasgow?" I'm like, "The band," and I'm like, "Oh, okay, hold on a second, let me ask him." I said, "You guys are interested in playing." Glasgow, and they're like, what's the, you know, what's the damage? And, you know, I gave them all the numbers, and they're like, hell yeah, let's do it. So then I'm like, okay, a couple of days later, I was like, well, we got something else. We got Belgium. So I'm like, oh, wow, that's great, you know. I don't know anything about Europe. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, wow, two shows, you know, like, it couldn't be that bad, you know, like. And so I started booking the flights, and I'm like, whoa, man, this thing is like, hours away from each other say yeah because it's the uk and it's europe <laughs> and i'm like oh man what the hell so <laughs> so we booked the flights and we get there and um we fly to iceland and um me and the guys all five of us um four musicians it's me and then we get to glasgow and we're dead tired and um despised uh the band despised that that it was their record release party but they were a wonderful group of kids, you know, like, they helped us so much. They came to the airport, they picked us up, they dropped us off at the, you know, at the hotel. Wow. They checked up on us. They came to the hotel to come, even though we were, dra I was dragging, like, a little suitcase, they came and picked the suitcase and dragged it themselves, <laughs> you know, with the merch, because I had brought some leftovers. Yeah, yeah. And then they, um, they even printed our merch, uh, our merch from and it came from another band called Pest Control. Okay, they're from I think they're from Leeds. So they they drove over or um, got on the ferry and they brought our merch. And um, at the end of the day, you know, when the show was ended, they they brought our merch back to the hotel and they they just made they just took good care of us. Uh, wow, and it was an experience that I would never forget. Like. The journey in love, like they didn't know us, but we felt like we knew those guys, and they're so much younger than us. We felt like we known them forever. Wow! And like we clicked right away. Like the band was so appreciative, and they're like they want to play there again, and they just want to like hang out with those guys because everybody gets hurt. It's it's one of those bands that been out for a while, but they were always the underdogs. Uh huh. And there were never those bands that, you know, went up the ladder. They played, a, they did a lot of cool things. They played a lot of cool shows. Um, they've been a band since 96. You know, they sold the world. But they were always, like, kind of the underdogs. Yeah, for sure. And that's why they kind of like playing with the small bands. Uh-huh. Because the small bands always show them love. And they return the love. And these guys are a great group of guys to work with. Easy going. Um, you know, if they have the time, they have the time, you know, if they don't, they don't, you know, and you know, we had to turn down shows, you know, uh -huh. because I'm going away from Puerto Rico and it's like, yo, we can't function without you. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, you're like the fifth member. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, and you were telling me, um, before we started this, that, uh, about EGH, uh, playing with brass knuckle brigade and oh and yeah Philly. yeah that was what crazy was that like? it was great because those two bands they're like this they're like brothers like those guys known each other since they were in each other's weddings you yep, know yep. like um martin you know like 
Martin knows Rob's kids, Chris's kids, um, wives and everything. Vice versa, like Chris B, he knows all of their children. Like, it was great because, you know, they haven't played Muttley. Muttley and Martin, especially Jay, hasn't played shows in a, quite a while. Yep. And Jay hasn't really got Jay, uh, Phil Vibe's son, he played, he did like a couple of things with his dad, with the Julius, like one show or something, but now he's a little bit more consistent with a band. And uh, he's enjoying it. Like, he was there, we were chilling. Like, he's like having fun. Like, he's connecting, he's making friends. You know, um, uh, most importantly, he's doing music. Yeah, 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 and he's a, a phenomenal guitarist. Yeah, he's a really good guitarist, and... You know, he's just easy going too. He's another one that it's down to earth and like he mingles with any crowd. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. Um But it was a good time for both bands. So uh so what's what's next for you? More EGH, any anything else that you wanna do um in the scene in the next uh, little bit? Yeah, I'm doing the EGH um we're doing the EGH in Florida. I think Cali is next month. Um, for the scene, like, uh, I'm, I'm trying to see if I could try to, like, connect with people, like, who has the same vision. Like, maybe eventually try to, like, do something here in the Bronx again. You know, see what's out there. Like, try to, like, push something, you know, you know, down here, you know, there's, I'm pretty sure there's spots, but, um, you know, like one day maybe talk with Gary, you know, Gary, Gary Mutley was like, always like, like where the shows were, Gary were, was uh -huh. like Gary, um, Gary didn't even have to like your music, but he will go to, to your shows to check you guys out or something like that. So like, I'm pretty sure like those guys and, and Brass Knuckle Brigade, like, Gary, Jay, or you know, like for example, um, Dave Mitchell. Uh huh. Would want to see something in the Bronx, but I don't know what would it take. You know, like I'm good at putting things together. I'm just not good at starting like the fire. You know, like I need a spark. So like yeah. I would want to see more Bronx stuff here because you know that's all we talk about. Like me and my boy, we like yo dude. Bro, like, we should, like, there was actually another kid named Gabe, who's Filipino, who's very younger, who was like, dude, we should do a show at the, uh, at the Bronx Brewery, um, and he's like, I know people there, and then I have another friend named Albert, but it's just a matter of, like, connecting the dots, and I'm like, we need, like, Bronx bands, but we also need modern bands. That's right, that's right, absolutely. Because a mix, a, a mix because if we just book Bronx bands or something like that, it's not gonna do too well. Yeah, we want to do like modern bands, uh, so like we we should do something in the Bronx because it's been long due. That's right, and and I feel like I don't know, I, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts on this are, but you know. I feel like hardcore, actually, you know, death metal too, and thrash, they've all experienced such a like, like, they've blown up even more in the last few years. Yes. And into the mainstream even. I mean, you know, you have groups like uh, uh, Turnstile, like, that are suddenly huge, and like, it's hard to imagine. I know, and you know, Turnstile, I have a great story about them. I put out their first band. Oh really? Yeah, on on the attack, it was called One Step Too Many. Wow! So I've known those guys since 2005, when Brady, the little short guitarist that just recently left, yeah, was nine years old. That's crazy. Oh, like eight or something. That's and he, crazy. I went to this Christian festival uh, called Face Down Rec uh, Face Down Fest. So they were there, and uh, fast forward a year later or two years later, I heard their demo. I think Brady was Brady switched from guitar to like vocals, and I was like, "Yo, this is dope!" And I eventually booked them in Staten Island, and then I signed them. So it was like at when Turnstile started, it was three members of Turnstile. Uh -huh. I mean, three members of, of One Step Too okay, Many. One Step Too Many turned into Turnstile, wow. except the drummer and the 
the drummer of Turnstile, of One Step Too Many, sorry, became the singer. Uh -huh. Brady was on guitar, I started singing, and then one guitar player from One Step Too Many went there. So the difference was the drummer and there was the bass player, the, the um, France, the African American kid that plays bass. Yeah. So it was pre pretty much the same members. Wow. Four members. Wow, that's crazy. And um, I had no idea. When people uh, say, "Oh yeah, you know, a lot of kids don't like them," and like Turnstile because they're kind of mainstream now, but uh, I, I will point them out to my record. I'm like, "Yeah, I put this out," and they're like, "Really? This? I never knew that you put this out. Like, you put." put out um, Under the Bar. It was called One Step Too Many Under the Bar. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I put that out. And um, it was great working with them. And they were, they were really good to me. And like they, I see them at shows uh, from time to time. And they like, they talk. Yeah, 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 for sure. Wow. Um, I, I booked those guys in Connecticut. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And in Staten Island. I booked in Puerto Rico, too. Wow. I booked... Uh, Book Cornerstone, like I booked a, I got one of my bands put Cornerstone. I don't know if you ever heard of Cornerstone. I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah big yeah, Christian yeah, yeah. music press. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Um. So, a couple more questions for you, and then you know, if, if there's other things that we haven't talked about yet that you want to talk about, um, then you should feel free to do so. But one of the questions that you know I always ask towards the end of these is, do you think there's like a Bronx hardcore or a Bronx like heavy kind of sound um, and if so like how would you describe that sound wow you know it, it I've heard that question so many times throughout your interviews and I think there is a sound like I think like bands like Fahrenheit 451 District 9 Irate they had their own sounds even Spawn a Chamber uh -huh. Billy Club with the punkish ska, kind of hardcore, little metalish, yep, you know style. That it was Bronx made. Now, if you go down to like, okay, you go down to Queens, you got Sworn Enemy, you got Full Blown Chaos, you got Thirty Six Deadly Fist, you got One Second Thought. Their uh -huh. their tone is very heavy and it's like consistent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. obviously not now for Sworn Enemy. They have changed your sound. Quite a bit, but yeah, I'm just sure. in Fumbron Chaos, you know. But we were a little bit more diverse. We were the Bronx, especially with bands like District 9, like growing up in 167, where they grew up. They grew up in 170, you know, Frank, uh, Puerto Rican Mike, uh, Caesar grew up in 167th uh, Street around that area, you know. They were like very hip hop influenced, uh -huh. so it was a that was a sound that we had and that a lot of my friends who got into hardcore like like my friend Lewis I keep bringing his name up because he says Billy Club sounds it's like a sound that nobody else has in the hardcore scene Fahrenheit 451 you know they had that kind of the post hardcore but like they had very heavy riffs and That's stuff right. like that. Like you didn't hear another Fahrenheit 451 in Queens That's or in right. Brooklyn and Staten Island. You know, like every borough had its its tone, but we had so much of a mixture of tones. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that's a, an excellent way to put it. Um, and then the final question, a little more general: um, What does the Bronx mean to you? The Bronx means a lot to me. It's it means culture, it means uh, survival. To me, it means um, you know growing up and you know not saying that we grew up poor, but we didn't grow up rich. It meant like if you could make it in the Bronx, you could make it anywhere. Um, you know, I've been through a lot. You know, I've been you know everybody's got their story. I've been mugged. I've been jumped. You know, I've been through it all, but. Here is where I have my opportunities, the Bronx, you know, and especially when it comes to music, when it comes even to work, what I do for a living, I connect with the Bronx. I rarely want to take jobs outside the Bronx. Yeah. You know, I try to connect with the community of, 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 of Riverdale. I try to connect with, 
you know, with these other um, places, uh, churches, spaces, because you know the Bronx is it's, it's a place of to me it's a place of opportunity, and and I, and and I had and I have had great opportunities here. I've made great friends. I've made great money. I made a living. I mean, I live in Riverdale, like which is one of the most expensive areas in 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 in, in, in the Bronx. Even more expensive than living in Tagalog's Neck or in City Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so if you could make it out of like what the people would call the zoo into like a really nice community, but don't forget where you came from. And, you know, I still every day I get my haircuts in the South Bronx, you know, East Trima. Uh huh. My, my mom still lives over there in 170, you know, and. Um, you know, every time I see something online or, or this and that, you know, I'm always up there defending the Bronx because, uh -huh. you know, it deserves this respect. Absolutely. And there's art. You know, there's, you know, my brother uh, told me he went to school with, uh, I believe it was Tracy, no, no, it was not Tracy Morgan, but he went to school with some stars in Clinton. Yeah, yeah, sure. Tracy sure. Morgan went to Clinton. That's right. Tracy Morgan, I see him once in a blue, like, on 238th. I yeah, know, yeah, yeah, I know yeah, he yeah. has a friend around there, but I, I'm like, I see the car. I'm like, wow, he's, he hangs out. Uh-huh. Fat Joe hung out of my block. Uh-huh. You know, and, you know, like, these are the people that, you know, make the Bronx better, you know. And um, in terms of culture, it's, it's, it's everything, you know, like... Um, we have everything here like that's you know my building itself we have we have a blend of cultures we have african americans we have americans we have italians we have chinese we have indians we have all kinds of backgrounds and and that's what attracted me more about uh riverdale you know it was more of a um more diversity yeah it was very diverse and that's why um i say the bronx is very diverse absolutely absolutely well are is there is there anything else you want to add anything that we haven't like had the chance to talk about or things that you you know forgot to mention anything no i think we mentioned it all. okay well thank you so much sam a lot of really really um spectacular history in this appreciate your time <laughs>